Historical Materialism and Primitive Societies. Having analyzed the rewriting of nature according to the code of production, it is also necessary to analyze the rewriting of history through the mode of production. In fact, the two projects are intertwined, since the crucial point of the materialist decipherment is societies without history. Moreover, it is not a matter of rewriting, but simply of writing. The schema of production does not reinterpret a nature present outside it. The schema of the mode of production does not reinterpret a history already there. Instead, the concepts of production and mode of production themselves produce and reproduce the concepts of nature and history as their space-time. The model produces this double horizon of extent and time. Nature is only its extent, and history only its trajectory. They do not need somehow to have their own names, because they are only emanations of the code, referential simulations that acquire the force of reality and behind which the code legislates. These are the laws of nature and the laws of history. A third instance recovers the other two. Their apparent movement is to be read in the dialectic, which also takes the force of law. These are the laws of the dialectic that govern history, and indeed nature, for Engels. All these concepts are articulated under the sign of materialism in a critical perspective, according to the critical illusion. This is not a perspective in the Nietzschean sense, which consists in deconstructing the imaginary universality of the solidist conceptual edifices, the subject, rationality, knowledge, history, dialectics, and restoring them to their relativity and symptomality, piercing the truth effect by which every system of interpretation doubles itself in the imaginary. In short, by unmasking ideology, in the present case, ideology under the materialist and dialectical sign of production. The logos and the pathos of production must be reduced according to this radical perspectivism. Structural causality and the primitives. Economic anthropology bears witness to the impossibility of accounting for societies without history, writing, or relations of production. One wonders with horror how they could exist without them. We will use as a reference Marxist anthropological thought, specifically Godelier's in Sur les Sociétés Pré-Capitalistes and L'Anthropologie Économique in L'Anthropologie Science des Sociétés Primitives. With all its concepts, this thought tackles a dangerous object and risks being analyzed in return if it does not quickly master that object. All critical analysis must aspire to this, but then what becomes of science? Hence, the object must be approached without dogmatism. The causality of the economy cannot be presented as the genesis of social superstructures outside the bosom of the economic infrastructure. It is hard to see what secret alchemy can make the economy become kinship, or for what mysterious reason the economic could be badly hidden under kinship. But who forces Godelier to seek it there? Perhaps there is nothing hidden at all, and he merely enjoys hide-and-seek. Does this doctrinal agility augur lacerating revision of concepts? Hardly. Immediately, one reads, thus the relations of kinship function both as elements of the infrastructure and as superstructure. What could this possibly mean? The mysterious reason is clearly the will to preserve the distinction between the infrastructure and the superstructure, without which historical materialism collapses. All the rest is only reformist scrupulosity. By an adjustment of the concept of mode of production, Marxist anthropology thus seeks from beginning to end to preserve materialist orthodoxy against the heresy of primitive societies. The economist easily distinguishes the productive forces in these societies that rest on hunting, fishing, etc. The relations of production, on the contrary, do not appear separated from social, political, religious, or kinship relations. Logically, if there are no longer relations of production, since they are not definable as such, there is no longer any mode of production. And how can it be admitted that we can deal with productive forces before any relations of production have hatched? This is hardly a Marxist position. 
If the productive forces are only the emanation or exercise of pre-existing relations, there is no sense in implanting this concept as such. Furthermore, the concept must produce, come what may. The separation of productive forces and relations of production must be saved, relieved of keeping the relations of production on ice, if they are not still to appear as separated. This facile cleverness saves the dialectical grid, which establishes the economy as the determinant instance. But the only dialectic here is that of the reproduction of the theory through the formal simulation of its object. The theory results in a perfect sophism of recovery, undoubtedly the masterpiece of a structuralist materialism with scientific pretensions. The fundamental task of economic anthropology is to analyze the role of the economy as determinant in the last instance, and, relative to the modes of production and the historical epochs, the dominant role of social structures which at the same time fix the non-economic functions. Dominant? Determinant? What can this mean if not the remodeling of the infra-superstructure determinist causality into a more flexible causality allowing the retention of economic determinism? Clarifying this, moreover, Marx writes, This much, however, is clear, that the Middle Ages could not live on Catholicism, nor the ancient world on politics. On the contrary, it is the mode in which they gained a livelihood that explains why here politics, and there Catholicism, played the chief part. Finally, argues Godelier, no society can exist without economics. Hence, economics is the determinant instance. If so, then many things can take the role of determinant instance, for example, language. In any case, here is the extreme limit of the theoretical adjustment by which Godelier risks showing how nothing essential has changed. Under certain conditions, kinship is economy, and religion can function directly as a relation of production. This is as much as saying that he cannot imagine the primacy of anything except through the primacy of the economy, and certainly this is linked to the primacy of history. As soon as humanity exists, the functions of economics, kinship, and ideology exist with a determined content and form. This content and this form are transformed with history and by it. In sum, anthropology and history turn up as two complementary fragments of the single science of history. Godelier exhibits a theoretical mania for fragmenting the object into functions in order then to dialecticize them historically. In fact, to structuralize them under the hegemony of one of them and to reconcile the whole under the sign of science. All this is false. It is the paranoid idealist projection of a rationalizing machine where all concepts are mutually engendered according to an apparent dialectical movement. Production economy, science, history, but in fact finalized by a science which sees only separation and which, to be fulfilled, projects an imaginary anthropology of separated functions. Productivism, scientism, and historicism all fashion for anthropology an object in their own image, dislocated so that it responds to their own theoretical manipulation. In this regard, Godelier innocently affirms that for reasons internal to his scientific practice, the anthropologist must question the ideology that beleaguers the interior of his scientific practice. But what if this scientific practice by itself was already this ideology? In that case, there is no need for interrogation. But the specificity of the anthropological object is precisely the impossibility of defining the economic and the mode of production as a separated instance. The very least requirement would thus be to re-examine the whole matter starting from this non-separation. This is impossible for a science that can only, dialectically, to the hierarchical advantage of one instance, synthesize its object, having carefully dismantled it. No ideology is more profound than this one so profound that it eludes Marx's scientific goodwill. The Copernican revolution has not yet occurred in anthropology, and, in its geocentric and egocentric discourse, bourgeois and Marxist Western thought continues to describe the apparent movement of primitive exchanges. Surplus and anti-production Everywhere, Godelier's position is full of abrupt postulations and ambiguous extrapolations. For example, one can say in general that in a primitive society the producers control their means of production and their own labor – 
that production is oriented more towards the satisfaction of needs than toward the search for a profit, that exchange, when it exists, operates according to culturally determined principles of equivalence between goods and services which circulate among the partners of the exchange. There are no producers, there are no means of production, and no objective labor, controlled or not. There are no needs and no satisfactions that orient them. This is the old illusion of subsistence economy. And exchange does not operate according to principles of equivalence, even culturally determined ones. The exchange gift, to be exact, operates not according to the evaluation or equivalence of exchange goods, but according to the antagonistic reciprocity of persons. All this is more or less fraudulently exported from our political economy. Even if the intention is to nuance the structure and modalities of primitive economy, the result is to inscribe it in the same discourse as ours, with the same code. It means looking at primitive society from the wrong end. Consider the production of a surplus. There is ever-renewed amazement at the fact that primitives do not produce a surplus, whereas they could produce one. It is impossible to think this non-growth, this non-productive desire. The West, as is logical with regard to its own assumptions, always thinks of it as an anomaly, a refusal to produce. If the primitives produce, it is incomprehensible that they do not produce more. Production implies the expanding reproduction of productive forces. The truth of production is productivity, a quantitative growth function. The solution must be that they produce only for their needs. But this is to fall from Charybdis to Scylla since needs themselves are an undefined function, and it is completely arbitrary to arrest them at the threshold of a basic minimum of survival, which has no strict economic justification and derives directly from moral philosophy. From a distinct opposition, we have reinvented starting from a moral conception of the superfluous and the artificial, and from the functionalist vision of the instinct for self-preservation. The savages are nature, when they have enough, they stop producing. This formula contains both perplexed admiration and racist commiseration. Moreover, it is false. The savages fritter away their resources in feasts and risk living beneath the basic minimum. And although he shows very well how in their festive exchanges, the Cyan pour back the extra that comes from contact with white civilization, Godelier persists in affirming that in nearly every case, primitive societies produce a surplus, but they do not. Or, better yet, this surplus remains in a potential state. Note, Marx says, By thus acting in the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. Capital, Volume 1. In fact, this concept makes no sense for them. How could reasons to produce a surplus occur to them? Only the anthropologist has good reasons to produce it, so that he can discreetly impute it to the savages and then dejectedly verify their bewildering indifference in this regard. Subsistence plus surplus. Only the presupposition of production permits this quantitative reduction to additional functions, neither of which makes sense in primitive exchange. Subsistence, basic minimum, needs. These are only some of the magical concepts to which the anthropologist has recourse in resolving the impossible economic equation of primitive societies. Other variables help correct the infrastructural equation, the social, the cultural, the historical, the same desperate patching up as in our modernist neo-economics. The simple correlation, at other times assumed, between the existence of a surplus, leisure time, invention of culture, and the progress of civilization today no longer appears to be based on the facts and demands a reinterpretation of the conditions of the evolution of social life and history. But this correlation demands nothing at all, especially not to be mended and corrected by categories derived from the same discourse. This totally artificial construct simply calls for being deconstructed into its terms. The conclusion would then be reversed. The infrastructure is not adequate. It can be mixed with the socio-cultural, but this is equally abstract since, strictly speaking, the socio-cultural specified as such designates only what is left over from the infrastructure. Cordelier's mistake is wanting, like Baron Munchausen, to get out of the vessel by pulling himself up by the hair.
The productivity of labor is measured not only in technical terms, it depends even more on social conditions. Hence, there is something social in primitive societies which prevents technology from developing and producing a surplus. These acrobatics of the reduction of factors and the remixing in the dominant is only conceptual violence. We now know that it is even more destructive than missionaries or venereal disease. Having contested the correlation between surplus and culture, Godelier quickly recaptures it for his account in a different form. These economies do not limit themselves to the production of subsistence goods. They produce a surplus destined for the functioning of social structures, kinship, religion, etc. These societies seem to be sustained according to manuals of modern economics. They obey the same rationality of choice, calculation, allocation of resources, etc., an imagery that is, moreover, as false for our societies as for the primitives. Hence they subsist, and they then begin to exist socially. Here again is the absurd attempt to make a separate function out of the social. Primitive society does not exist as an instance apart from symbolic exchange, and this exchange never results from an excess of production. It is the opposite, to the extent that these terms apply here, Subsistence and economic exchange are the residue of symbolic exchange, a remainder. Symbolic circulation is primordial. Things of functional use are taken from that sphere. Ultimately, the subtraction will be null, and everything will be symbolically consumed. Nothing remains because survival is not a principle. We have made it one. For the primitives, eating, drinking, and living are first of all acts that are exchanged. If they are not exchanged, they do not occur. But the residual is still too arithmetic. In fact, there is a certain type of exchange, symbolic exchange, where the relation, not the social, is tied, and this exchange excludes any surplus. Anything that cannot be exchanged or symbolically shared would break the reciprocity and institute power. Better yet, this exchange excludes all production. The exchanged goods are apportioned and limited, often imported from far away according to strict rules. Why? Because, given over to individual or group production, they would risk being proliferated and thereby break the fragile mechanism of reciprocity. Godelier says that Everything happens as if primitive societies had instituted scarcity. But this scarcity is not the quantitative restrictive scarcity of a market economy. It is neither privative nor antithetical to abundance. It is the condition of symbolic exchange and circulation. It is not the socio-cultural realm that limits potential production. Instead, exchange itself is based on non-production, eventual destruction, and a process of continuous, unlimited reciprocity between persons, and inversely, on a strict limitation of exchanged goods. It is the exact opposite of our economy based on unlimited production of goods and on the discontinuous abstraction of contractual exchange. In primitive exchange, production appears nowhere as an end or a means. The meaning occurs elsewhere. It is not there as even underlying potential. On the contrary, in its accumulative finality and its rational autonomy, reduction is always end and means. It is continually negated and volatilized by reciprocal exchange which consumes itself in an endless operation. Gordelier ignores all this and colors the objects of exchange with his schema. At first they function, note the obsession with functionality, as commodities, then at the interior, as objects of gift and prestige. The same object thus changes function, but the second of these two functions is dominant. Implication, the first function is dominant. Thus the code of Marxist anthropology is saved by multifunctional superimposition. From here one can easily go on to disentangle by simple decantation our own historical stage, we have never left it, in which political economy, and with it its materialist critique, is finally able to recognize what is its own. Thus one understands better why, from antiquity to our own day, these objects are stripped more and more of their dominant trait, as objects to be given, and why they become specialized in the dominant mode of commercial objects, 
while preserving a traditional aspect. The term stripped indicates the profound theoretical racism of these categorizations, which intend only to produce in the course of history what these objects already were, in the matrix of an archaic economy without being known as such. What historical materialism makes them into? Objects of production. For all these objects and men lost in their primitive limbo, this is the baptism of production. The baptism of labor and value for nature and goods lost in the gratuity of their richness. The baptism of the economic, of the mode of production, and of the determinant instance for all these exchanges that knew neither instance, determination, nor economic rationality. The materialist missionaries have arrived. Magic and Labor The same blind determinism in several instances leads to the same kind of incomprehension of magic. For primitive man, labor is experienced and thought as the interior and indivisible unity of magic and technical knowledge. In other words, the Trobrianders know that it is necessary to work in their gardens, but they think that this work is not enough and that magic is indispensable in order to guarantee the harvest. Magic is basically only insurance on the productive forces of nature. By his magical practices, man thinks he can insert himself in the natural order's chain of necessary causalities. In nature, he sees forces that he spontaneously endows with human attributes. He conceives of it, by analogy with society, as a network of intentional relations, where the rituals and magical practices were designed to underhandedly influence these forces, etc. This vulgar rewriting of magic is always dominated by the prejudice of a separated nature and man, a separated nature and society, then rethought by analogy, and by the image of a primitive naive, mischievous, rational, irrational, who compels nature to produce by transforming it through labor or manipulating it through signs. Projected here is the worst Western psychology, our own melange of rational pragmatism and superstitious obsession. It is hard to imagine for what mysterious reason, as Godelier says, control of forces could coexist with a rational operation. If not by his own magic of the interior and indivisible unity above. It is not true for archaic agriculture, as Vernon demonstrates in Travail et Nature dans la Grèce ancienne, nor a fortiori for the primitive hunter or farmer. Like the Greek peasant, the primitive contributes much less to the harvest by his pains than by the periodic repetition of rites and festivals. Neither land nor effort is a factor of production, Effort is not invested labor power, recovered many times over in value at the end of a production process. It is in a different form, as full of ritual as the exchange gift lost and given without economic calculation of return and compensation. And the fruits of the harvest are not its equivalent, as by an excess they maintain exchange, the symbolic coherence of the group with the gods and nature. Moreover, part of the harvest will immediately be returned as first fruits in the process of sacrifice and consumption in order to preserve this symbolic movement. Above all, it must never be interrupted because nothing is ever taken from nature without being returned to it. Primitive man does not chop one tree or trace one furrow without appeasing the spirits with a counter-gift or sacrifice. This taking and returning, giving and receiving, is essential. It is always an actualization of symbolic exchange through goods. The final product is never aimed for. There is neither behavior aiming to produce useful values for the group through technical means, nor behavior aiming at the same end by magical means. This is really why there is no scarcity. Scarcity only exists in our own linear perspective of the accumulation of goods. Here it suffices that the cycle of gifts and countergifts is not interrupted. And it is simply absurd to define primitive activity as abstract subjectivity, utility, or objective transformation, labor, or suppletory magic. Magic in the sense that we understand it, as a direct objective appropriation of natural forces, is a concept only negatively determined by our rational concept of labor. To articulate magic and labor in one interior and indivisible unity only seals their disjunction. It ultimately disqualifies primitive symbolic practices as irrational in opposition to rational labor. As in the case of objects, 
A simple observation of historical decantation produces the materialist stage of the real domination of nature. Marx says, All mythology masters and dominates and shapes the forces of nature in and through imagination. Hence it appears as soon as man gains mastery over the forces of nature. Is Achilles possible side by side with powder and lead, or is the Iliad at all compatible with the printing press and steam press? This crushing argument masks the entire problematic of the symbolic under a functionalist, finalist, retrospective view of mythology and magic, in which it only awaits men's rational and technical domination in order to disappear. Epistemology 3. Materialism and Ethnocentrism We must now pose again the problem of the general epistemology of historical materialism. 1. Marx outlined the formula for it, precisely in relation to labour, in the Grundrisse. The conception of labour in this general form, as labour as such, is also immeasurably old. Nevertheless, when it is economically conceived in this simplicity, Labour is as modern a category as are the relations which create this simple abstraction. This example of labour shows strikingly how even the most abstract categories, despite their validity, precisely because of their abstractness, for all epochs, are nevertheless, in the specific character of this abstraction, themselves likewise a product of historical relations, and possess then full validity only for and within these relations. What does it mean to say valid for all epochs, and fully applicable only for some? This is the same mystery as the simultaneous subordination of infra and superstructure, and the dialectical coexistence of a dominance and a determination in the last instance. If the institution of the individual as laborer in this nudity is itself a historical product, Marx, if labor is not a real category of tribal economy, then how could the concept of labor be applicable because of its very abstractness? This abstraction is precisely what creates the problem. At the same time that it produces the abstract universality of labor, of labor power, our epoch produces the universal abstraction of the concept of labor and the retrospective illusion of the validity of this concept for all societies. Concrete, actual, limited validity is that of an analytic concept. Its abstract and unlimited validity is that of an ideological concept. This distinction concerns not only labor, but the whole conceptual edifice of historical materialism, production, productive forces, mode of production, infrastructure, not to mention the dialectic and history itself. All these concepts are in fact historical products, beyond the field that produced them, especially if they want to be scientific. They are only the meta-language of a Western culture, Marx is to be sure, that speaks from the height of its abstraction. 2. Nevertheless, it is not a matter of a simple exportation or extrapolation of concepts. Marx clarifies his approach in the same passage. Bourgeois society is the most developed and the most complex historic organization of production. The categories which express its relations, the comprehension of its structure, thereby allows insights into the structure and relations of production of all the vanished social formations out of whose ruins and elements it built itself up, whose partly still unconquered remnants are carried along with it, whose mere nuances have developed explicit significance within it, etc. Human anatomy contains a key to the anatomy of the ape. The intimations of higher development among the subordinate species, however, can be understood only after the higher development is already known. Althusser saw in this passage a theoretical revolution in relation to naive genetic evolutionism. This is certainly so, and evolutionism is dead. But isn't this retroactive structuralism still an ideological process, now in the sense of a structural reconstruction through a simulation model, instead of empiricist, finalist evolutionism? First, it is not certain that the comparison with the anatomy of the ape is anything more than a metaphor. What guarantees the permanence of the same scheme of intelligibility when one goes from the bioanatomical sphere to the human one of symbolism and historical societies? Nothing is less certain. This is no more certain than that the adult can comprehend the child only in terms of the adult. In any case, 
In the presupposition of this continuity, there is a positivist alignment of all analytic approaches with those of the so-called exact sciences. If one does not admit this hypothesis and maintains a specificity of meaning and of the symbolic, Marxism contains a miscomprehension of a rupture far more profound than the one Althusser detects. But let us return to the central argument. Does the capitalist economy retrospectively illuminate medieval, ancient, and primitive societies? No. Starting with the economic and production as the determinant instance, other types of organization are illuminated only in terms of this model, and not in their specificity, or even, as we have seen in the case of primitive societies, in their irreducibility to production. The magical, the religious, and the symbolic are relegated to the margins of the economy. And even when the symbolic formations expressly aim, as in primitive exchange, to prevent the emergence with the rise of economic structures of a transcendent social power that would escape the group's control, things are arranged nonetheless so as to see a determination by the economic in the last instance. Models never go beyond their shadows. Be it infinitely diversified and complicated, a model of political economy never permits us to go beyond political economy or to grasp what is on this side of it, or elsewhere. Marx's phrase, bourgeois society, etc., is symptomatic. It assumes productivity in all societies, at least a kernel of it, from which the model of political economy can radiate. If this were true, political economy would be totally correct. If it is not true, this structural implantation of the mode of production can only make the specific reality of a given type of society burst into satellitized, disjointed categories, then re-articulated in terms of relative autonomy and dominance. Science will be vindicated, but at what price? The old finalism is not dead. It has simply moved from a finality of content, traditional evolutionism, to a structural finality of the model and the analysis itself. 3. We have a new objection to deal with. It is not the model of political economy itself that permits the illumination of earlier societies. It is the analysis of their contradictions, which for Marx is the same thing as the analysis of their structures. Let us say in passing that the metaphor of the ape is worthless. Certainly the ape's anatomical structure cannot be illuminated starting from the contradictions of human anatomy. In the same passage, Marx says, Although it is true, therefore, that the categories of bourgeois economics possess a truth for all other forms of society, this is to be taken only with a grain of salt. They can contain them in a developed or stunted or caricatured form, etc., but always with an essential difference. The so-called historical presentation of development is founded, as a rule, on the fact that the latest form regards the previous one as steps leading up to itself. And since it is only rarely and only under quite specific conditions able to criticize itself, it always conceives them one-sidedly. The Christian religion was able to be of assistance in reaching an objective understanding of earlier mythologies only when its own self-criticism had been accomplished to a certain degree. Likewise, bourgeois economics arrived at an understanding of feudal ancient oriental economics only after the self-criticism of bourgeois society had begun. Hence the crisis and the analysis of the crisis is what permits the comprehension of earlier societies in their difference and originality. Although this appears incontestable, it still participates in the critical and dialectical illusion. Western culture was the first to critically reflect upon itself, beginning in the 18th century. But the effect of this crisis was that it reflected on itself also as a culture in the universal, and thus all other cultures were entered in its museum as vestiges of its own image. It aestheticized them, reinterpreted them on its own model, and thus precluded the radical interrogation these different cultures implied for it. The limits of this cultural critique are clear. Its reflection on itself leads only to the universalization of its own principles. Its own contradictions lead it, as in the previous case, to the worldwide economic and political imperialism of all modern capitalist and socialist Western societies. The limits of the materialist interpretation of earlier societies are the same. Those who have discovered primitive and savage arts have proved their goodwill 
and have shown all the lucidity one could ask about the art's originality and complexity. Without bias, they have attempted to relocate these works into their magic and religious context. In the kindest yet most radical way the world has ever seen, they have placed these objects in a museum by implanting them in an aesthetic category. But these objects are not art at all, and precisely their non-aesthetic character could at least have been the starting point for a radical perspective on, and not an internal critical perspective leading only to a broadened reproduction of, Western culture. Hence, in the materialist interpretation, there is only a replacement of art by economics, the aesthetic virus by the virus of production and the mode of production. What has been said of the one applies equally to the other. The analysis of the contradictions of Western society has not led to the comprehension of earlier societies or of the third world. It has succeeded only in exporting these contradictions to them. We agree with Marx when he says that there is a correlation between the analysis of our society's contradictions and the comprehension of earlier societies, but only if we note the partial level at which they both remain within historical materialism. The blindness of our primitive societies is necessarily linked to a weakness in the radical critique of political economy. This explains why, having failed to subvert the foundations of political economy, historical materialism results only in reactivating its model at a worldwide level, even if this model is dialectical and charged with contradictions. Through its most scientific inclinations toward earlier societies, it naturalizes them under the sign of the mode of production. Here again, their anthropological relegation to a museum, a process originated in bourgeois society, continues under the sign of its critique.